Well, hello, everybody. It's great to be back. I've been traveling a little bit. Uh, I spent last week as a speaker at America's Keswick in a Pines, uh, Tom's River, New Jersey. It is the oldest residential addiction program in the United States. And it's a camp and a conference center. And uh, what I love about going to Keswick is that people go there to try and experiment what might happen if you get people away from their normal distractions and habits and their friends and routines, and what if they would just spend some quality time with God and God's word and scripture and prayer? And last week I got to find out, and I love going there for the amazing stories from, uh, not just from conference guests, but like I, I, I just sit there and listen to, well, let me say this, it can be overwhelming and discouraging when you think about and see the impact of addiction in our society. Alcohol, drugs, opioids, it is, man, it's a mess. But I love going to Keswick because I get to hear stories about men and women who were once enslaved and impacted by just addictive lives. And then I get to hear about how they, they meet Jesus and they discover how much God loves them and they start changing. And, and I get to hear stories about people who uh, learn how to become free from addictions. It was a really great week. I'm also mentioning this because if you know anybody who uh, needs to spend some time in a rehab, uh, it's, a, it's really accessible. It's, they have a high success rate as well. And uh, I got connections, so uh, talk to me after if you want. But before that, I was on vacation with my extended family. I got a lot of siblings, and they got a lot of kids. We were in the mountains of North Carolina. Anyway, I have been traveling for a bit. And while I was on the road, I was thinking about how much technology has changed how we go on journeys. Like when I was a kid, man, if my family was going on a trip, my dad would go to AAA a couple months in advance. He'd get this travel map. It took forever, like somebody went through with a highlighter. And maybe I'm just misremembering things, but I remember the map being like, 30 feet long, right? It was folded up and highlighted with like turns and advice. And then my dad had this like month long debate, like what route are we gonna take to get there? Like today, it's, it's crazy. People ask me how I'm gonna get to a place and I go, well, I'm gonna type it in my phone and do whatever it tells me to do. Actually, in fact, this, this trip, I discovered something new. Uh, Google Maps was telling me the speed limit and then how fast I was going. And in fact, they actually started listing where there's speed traps. Not that I needed to know that, of course. Like, my phone is so cool. It tells me what's coming up next, and it helps me prepare for it. Like, it's great. Like, I, I can literally look at my phone and see where it turns red, and I'll go, oh, we're going to start slowing down in three, two, and there we are. It's crazy. And like a lot of people, I usually don't even go places without looking at the reviews. Anyone else look at reviews? You know what those are, right? You type in a place and you can look at the website and you can see how many stars they got and uh, what other people think about this place. Like, like even this church, uh, if you're visiting with us, odds are you already Googled the church, you checked out reviews as part of your journey to go to, of all things, a church. Most of the time, reviews are helpful. Sometimes they're not. Like, I, I started looking at a site called TripAdvisor, and there are some really funny reviews. Here's, here's some, I can see you laughing already. Here's some real reviews that were listed to give some insights to travelers to know what was coming up. This person, this is hilarious. Someone <laughs> goes to the beach for a beach vacation, and they're really disappointed. They only gave this place uh, three stars out of five. They said, it's a great beach, but it's too sandy. <laughs> like, what, really? Like, okay, or the next one's funny, too. Uh, here's a guy who goes to Scotland, and he gives the entire country a bad review because, get this, everybody he talked to in Scotland has, get this, a Scottish accent. And uh, this next guy, he goes to see the Eiffel Tower in uh, France and was so disappointed <laughs> because cause it was rusty and uh, clearly no one cared about it. And lots of people there spoke French. But I, I don't always go to trip you, you for the laughs. I look at reviews because it helps me when I know what's coming, when I know what to expect. 
I'd like to be ready for what's coming next in my trip. If I'm driving home on Friday morning and there's a big slowdown around the Woodbury Commons, I'd like to know. Because if I know what's next in my journey, if I know what to expect, I'll be better prepared for what's coming. Now think about this for a second. If your life is a journey, if it's like a trip, wouldn't you like to know what you're getting into? Wouldn't you love to know what to expect? Like so many of our challenges come when, we, when we're on this road and we're surprised, disappointed, or overwhelmed what's in our path because what you encounter in the road of life is not what you're planning on. Wouldn't it be nice to know? Wouldn't it be nice to be advised on the trip ahead of you so that you could know what to be ready for. This summer, we're gonna be looking at several Psalms, and I'd like to start with Psalm 23. Maybe a strange one to start with because it is maybe the most famous, familiar of the Psalms. You probably know this Psalm, but do you know what it is? We're about to read a trip advisor review. What should you expect on the journey of life? Like, you are all at some point in your life's journey, if you could know what to expect, what might be ahead? I think you'd be better adjusted, you'd be less stressed, and you might be more prepared for whatever's in your past. So let's get into it. This is Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. By the way, this is the theme. It's a simple idea. The premise is this. If God is my shepherd, I've got everything I need. It doesn't really matter what the road ahead of me looks like because I've got God. And by the way, have you ever heard the words, I have everything I need coming out of your mouth? When do you say that? I say that right after people are asking me, uh, do you got everything you need? Like, uh, like it looks like I'm in trouble, right? Like, uh, are you okay? And they ask that because it doesn't look like you're okay. Like when your car breaks down on the side of the road and someone stops and asks, do you need anything? Right? That's the sort of scenario when you find yourself saying, I lack nothing. I have everything I need. And you may be thinking, look, I, I, I am broken down. My tire might be flat, but I've got AAA. I've got a spare tire. I've got a cell phone and duct tape, I'm fine. Psalm 23 says, because I have, I mean, something bigger, because I have God, I'm gonna be okay. I've got everything I need to make it. Well, to make it through what? Like, what should I expect on this trip called life? Well, here we go, here's your trip review. Verse two, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Which sounds fantastic, right? Like sometimes life is just great. There's no complaints. This is really nice, right? In fact, if you're a sheep, life doesn't get much better than green pastures and quiet waters. The shepherd provides. And the ancient shepherds worked really hard at trying to find places like this for their sheep. They had to travel, and once a year, their flocks went through these long migrations in search of new places to graze and supplies of water. And Israel, of course, uh, well, it's sort of like a desert, right? The, not quite like here. Here, you could probably leave sheep in the same field all year without going too far. But in Israel, uh, grass was scarce. You just were constantly on the move. You had to go through uh, rocks and sand to find grass, and sometimes you did. And it was good. And on your journey of life, you should know that you might be able to expect good chapters and a little bit of chicken fry, know what I mean? Like sometimes it's good. And also, I, I wanna point this out. Uh, you see this language of right the shepherd leads along good routes, which implies that for people on this journey of life, 
you've got some choices. There are some options. And in scripture, you hear God saying there are some good routes, there are some bad routes, good ways, bad ways. There are some turns you should not take. Sometimes you find yourself at a good destination or a bad destination, and it's because you followed or didn't follow a right path that God lays out. This is just what you should expect in life. And if the psalm ended here, like this is what life is like, it's like being a sheep with plenty to eat. Uh, you're going to eat, you're going to drink, and I mean, not just surviving, but this is thriving. Oh, by the way, make good choices. Isn't God good? I'd like this psalm. This would be great if that's what life was going to be like. The psalm doesn't end in verse 3, right? Verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley. What? Hold on, wait. Let, let me get this straight. So God is leading me. He's my shepherd. God is caring for me. I'm following him. And he leads me where? What? Through the valley of the shadow of death? What? what? This has got to be a typo here, right? Like, why would this happen? Like, you should know, you should expect. Well, I'll say this, part of the migration pattern of ancient Israelite sheep, like part of being a sheep in Israel meant that every year in the migration through the spring landscape in search of the ever elusive grass and water, the flock of sheep would have always had to pass into and through the deep and rugged, they call them wadis in Israel. They're dry stream beds. They were cut through the semi-desert hills by the seasonal torrents. The winter rains unleashed these torrents, and you could still tour them today. They're, they're spooky. The air in the bottom of these valleys is heavy as the heat rises. It's a little foggy. And the, the canyon depths are swathed in dark shadows as the rising cliff walls keep out the distant sun. At this moment of crossing the wadi floor, the pleasant scenes of still water and green grass seem really, really far away. There's no grass. There's no water. If you're a sheep, the heat feels oppressive and this entire flock of sheep will struggle up and down the steep sides of these canyons on their way to the next feeding place. And here's what the trip you view from your life journey says. Even though you have all that you need, even though you're following the shepherd, and look, clearly, this isn't one of these things where like I'm a sheep and one time I wandered off and I ended up in a really bad spot. Like, that's not the story here. The story is I'm a sheep, I'm following the shepherd and I follow him and I do everything right. And what? How did, how did this happen to me, right? The psalmist is saying that Sometimes you going through a valley is actually part of God's plan somehow, which is really, really, really hard to read. Like, I would like to think that if I'm following Jesus, everything's going to be great, like green grass, and sometimes that is the case. But something else happens, and you should be ready for this. Sometimes you're close to God, and you're following God, and God leads you through valleys, which is just shocking and unexpected. And sometimes when you don't know that happens, it messes up Christians. Like last week I was at Keswick and I was talking to like a bunch of former addicts and it was a message from Colossians that you heard a month or two ago. And it was a passage where Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering. And, and I said, don't let setbacks set you back. And uh, one of the guys afterwards, he was from the addiction program, and he grabbed me afterwards and he started to tell me his story. And it sounded like this, he said, look, I was an addict for years, I messed up so much, I was going the wrong way. And he said, about five years ago, God grabbed my life, he changed me, I was saved, I started following Jesus, I was a new creation. And he said it was a miracle, it was great, I found Jesus, I, I was allowed to see my kids again, my wife, was seeing a counselor with me, we were starting to fix things, and I stopped using, he said, and I felt like I never had to go back to drugs ever again. God was so good. He said, I did my devotions, I prayed, I went to church, 
And he said, I thought that as long as I was saved, God would never put me back in a place where I felt like I needed to go back into addiction. Like God would never let bad things happen to me if I were one of his sheep, he said. And then he said, but bad things happen. Work got really stressful. Family life was way harder than I thought. One of my kids got sick, he said. So I started to use again. And I ended up back worse than I was before in this cycle of destructive behavior. So here I am in this program. And then he said, and he looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, I messed up because I didn't know. I wasn't ready. He said, I was shocked when I hit a valley. Then he said, nobody ever told me that God lets people he loves suffer sometimes. Here's what you need to know about the road ahead in your life. In this broken world, evil is unavoidable. Suffering is a constant. And I, I could have developed this a little bit more, but Psalm 23 is basically the calendar year for sheep in ancient Israel. Things are seasonal, and you should expect seasons. It'd be like if you live in Goshen, uh, you, you have to live through winters. In the wintertime, it is cold and snowy. You should be ready for that. You've got spring, where apparently it just rains every day. You should be ready for that. Then you've got summer, where it's hot. And then you've got fall, where fall is just wonderful. Like, it is part of the seasons of life. And you should be ready for all of that if you live here. Like, if you're a sheep in Israel, every year, over the course of a season, you walk through green grass, fresh water, you go through this horrible valley on the way to find more green grass. And if you're a follower of God, here's what you should expect. Here's what you should plan on. This is what you ought to be ready for. Suffering will probably interrupt your life. Relationships can be hard. Jobs can be stressful. People are going to let you down. And there's probably going to be accidents in your lifetime. There will be people you bury too soon. We live in a fallen world. We're just passing through it. So you should expect to get poison ivy. You're probably going to get stuck in traffic jams that will slow you down. You might even be close to this thing called cancer. Man, I, I hate that about it. You will not be able to avoid the unavoidable, sometimes overwhelming mess of evil on this side of heaven. It's just part of the journey. It's part of your trip. So what will you do? Well, let's just keep reading. I will fear no evil. Wow. For you, shepherd, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. Like, look, you may not be able to bypass the unavoidable evil times, the uh, overwhelming mess and evil on this side of eternity. But really, the best you could do is to not be afraid. And in this trip of you, the psalmist, well, he, his very real reasons for fear, they start to fade in the presence of his shepherd, God himself. Okay, let me just ask, pop quiz, you love those things. Does anybody, any biblical scholars here, anybody here, can you tell me what psalm comes right before Psalm 23? Okay, you got it. Psalm 22, right? Okay, you're, you're, you're sharp. You're pretty sharp. Psalm 22 is a psalm quoted extensively in Matthew and Mark to Jesus by the mockers as he's hanging on the cross. Psalm 23, and you, you could read it. It's, it hits you hard. It is the narrative of the valley. Sometimes you're critics. Sometimes it doubts in your own head that happen when you go through the valleys. The, psalm of, the psalmist of Psalm 22, he's taunted uh, by fears and doubts. You put the next slide. It, it, the doubts look like something like he trusts in the Lord, let the Lord rescue him. Like, oh, come on. He, he's a Christian. He should be fine. <laughs> like, and the psalmist affirms, uh, praise God anyway. And it continues, for God 
God really hasn't left you. God has not, the Psalm, Psalm 22 says, has not hidden his face from him. But God listens to their cry for help. In other words, when there are voices that say, you know, you're in a valley and God isn't helping you at all, godly people have responded, yes, he is. The rod and staff, of course, are symbols of a shepherd, tools of a powerful king. And the comfort that they both provide is the reassurance of guidance and correct paths, leading to abundant food and water and of protection by a shepherd from the danger of the enemies encountered on the areas between places of green grass. This psalm pleads with us that as the sheep trust the shepherd, even though they're going through a place that looks really scary, so you should trust God. Because there is hope that despite the valley you may find yourself in, the loving shepherd, this powerful king, will not leave you in that place. The next verse is actually pretty controversial. It seems to me like it is a shift from the whole shepherd-sheep journey metaphor. The psalmist continues, you prepare a table before me. Huh. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's, it's a different metaphor, nothing about sheep or shepherds. It's, it's changing from the, the ups and downs of migrating sheep to a new picture. The faithful, the followers of God who are affirmed and honored by God, even though there is a backdrop presence of an enemy, metaphor changed a bit. God is no longer a shepherd, he's a host. And the trusting follower sits as honored guests at God's table. And table fellowship in Bible times was a metaphor, a picture of realizing a close connection with God himself. If you're not familiar with this sort of ancient image, to accept another as a guest at one's table was a big deal. It was to set aside enmity and assume responsibility for the safety of the guest while seated at your table. And for people like you and me to sit at God's table is to enjoy fellowship and, I'll use the word, communion with God himself. And to do so in the presence or the backdrop of enemies or suffering is to have one's special relationship with God declared publicly in the context of divine blessing and security. Like even though, right, even though I'm in a valley, God is with me. Though I'm going through a rough time, my shepherd cares. And, and I know that God's blessing on the other side of this awaits for me. Life may throw a lot at you. Sometimes it's really great, but that's going to change. Sometimes it's really bad, and that's going to change too. There's only one real constant in your journey of life as a Christian, that you're not alone. That your loving, powerful shepherd is with you, no matter what, and you have what you need. That is Psalm 23. Who, who is helped by this tribute? Well, I think all of us, right? I think for all of us, it helps to realize that no matter where you are in this journey, you're not the first to go there. Like, if I'm gonna travel somewhere that I haven't been before, if I find a place, a park, a restaurant, if I look it up on my phone and I figure out no one's ever gone there, uh, it makes me nervous. Like, when I moved to Goshen, I uh, looked up parks, and there's this place called Good Time Park, and I was like, this is where we're going to hang out, but no one else had been there before, because it's not a good park. I like to go to places where lots of other people go, because it's safer and it's familiar. Uh, Psalm 23, though, is a map of a road well-traveled by godly people, like Old Testament saints. 
I sent you out an article this week on the email from uh, Doug Green, and I hope lots of you were able to read about Psalm 23 and, and the connection to Job. Job was one of those saints. He experienced the good and the valley and God's faithfulness, even though he looked and walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Job still saw God's power. The article, I mean, it's, it's worth reading. It explains more than I did about the migration and the sheep thing. If you didn't get it, make sure you're signed up for emails. I, I think stuff like that is really worth reading. But uh, this review about life and death, this map, like, I mean, think about all the other people who traveled this before. Job, for example. It would have, like, I, Job wishes he knew what was ahead, right? Uh, one fascinating exercise for me is to think about what would it be like for any Old Testament saint? God's faithful people who saw this trip review and claimed it and God as their own. So I picture David, or Elijah, or Elisha, or any of the other followers of God in the Old Testament. Like, how did this road map look for any of them? For me though, I think the most fascinating person for me to think about singing this psalm and going down this route is the Lord Jesus. And right away, I think when you read this psalm, a lot of Christians think, and they're right, Jesus is a good shepherd, and he is. But think about this. Jesus sang these words. Picture Jesus as a young kid. He was Jewish. He was in the temple. Like, as a good Jewish person, he would have sung through the Psalter. He would have uh, stood in a place like this and sung the words, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Like, Jesus sang those words. And for me, the, the clearest connection to that is looking at Psalm 22. Jesus lived that out. Like in Matthew and Mark's crucifixion story, Psalm 22, you, you'll see footnotes and quotes in your Bibles. Psalm 22 is all, oh, it's all over the, the story of the crucifixion. Whenever I read Psalm 23, I, I think about Jesus' journey, his map. Our Savior had some good times. He had some awful times. In fact, Maybe the biggest difference between Jesus' journey through this and mine is when, G when Jesus goes through his valley of the shadow of death, God turns his face away. Something that he doesn't do for us. But this, this cross here, this symbol of torture and suffering and death, this right here should tell you all you need to know about the question of whether God lets people he loves suffer. But it's an empty cross because Jesus left the dark valley of Psalm 23. He suffered, he gave his flesh and his blood, yet he faced evil unafraid. The empty cross behind me is a symbol of God's great victory and joy through the resurrection suffering in Christ, like because Jesus walked through the valley of Psalm 23, it means that you and I, on the other side of this, we can have fellowship with God at a table like this. Which for me, like I, I think it, it changes how I read Psalm 23. Because I think Christians can read Psalm 23 too, like we still live out this journey, this is still what your life looks like. But you have an advantage over the Old Testament saints. Because we didn't just go, the Lord is my shepherd. We know that our shepherd actually walked this journey before us. Like Jesus had to go through all of life's ups and downs, happiness, joys, tragedy, and suffering. In fact, when we take communion, this table set before us, this is a symbol of the fact that Jesus went through a very dark valley, an act that gives us intimate fellowship with God. Like we get to celebrate right here that Jesus went boldly because of his deep, deep love for us. Jesus suffered for us. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you should know what to expect. You should know what your life might look like. Things might be good, things might be rough, but you should also expect that even when you feel like God has forsaken you, He is not. 
the Lord is your shepherd. You have all that you need. And I'm convinced that if you could start seeing the road ahead of you with the clarity offered by Psalm 23, I'm convinced that it would give you the courage to keep going forward with confidence unafraid. I, I think this would empower you to live your life undeterred by evil because this is communion. God is with you always. So Father in heaven, we are so grateful that because of your deep, incredible love for us, because you are our shepherd, no matter what is next, no matter what surprises or joys or hopes or discouragement that's ahead of us. You are with us. Can you give us the courage to be unafraid of evil? When we go through dark valleys, can you keep our eyes focused on you? And may we remember and praise you for going down this path before us. As we take communion soon, May you bless these thoughts to our minds and give courage in our souls. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.